A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will anguish, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword? No. In all these things we conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. of an eclipse of the sun. The veil of the temple was torn down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Now there was a virtuous and righteous man named Joseph, who though he was a member of the council, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. After he had taken the body down, he wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid him in a rock-hewn tomb in which no one had yet been buried. But at daybreak on the first day of the week, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were puzzling over this, Behold, two men in dazzling garments appeared to them. They were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. They said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has been raised. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. It stinks. That's what Chris Howling, the principal of Xavier, said about grace now. It stinks. There's no spinning grace now. It just stinks. That's what Chris said. And I agree. One of the reasons that it stinks is that it all seems so unfair. And I think the kids here can certainly even relate to this. When a parent dies, when parents die, they take with them a large portion of the past. But when children die, they take away the future as well. And I think that's what makes the valley of the shadow of death seem so incredibly dark and unending. And that is why, even with healing, even years later, there will always be a soreness and a swelling about the hearts of those who love Greg. A week ago this past Monday at Desert Regional Hospital, I was there. Room 3131. But I sure wasn't there alone. Xavier High School was all over the place of Desert Regional. They were in the waiting room, they were in the hallways, and most especially, they were in room 3131. I was there to anoint Greg. The boys were there. There were some girls, mostly boys, water polo buddies, Eagle Scout buddies, tennis buddies. They're all around, gathered around the bed of their friend. The friend who said hi at school, even the kids they did not know well. 
The friend who loved nature, the friend who loved animals, the friend who had a zest for life, really a gay, bright little boy, who found fun even when there was no fun to be found, who made everyone feel welcome, is now surrounded at his bed by his friends. And I think in a way, he is still making them feel welcome. And the boys are telling him stories, and the boys are singing to him, and the boys are telling jokes. And when I talked to Karen, Greg's mother, this week, she was talking about those boys, and this is what she said. This is a direct quote. She said, whoever marries these boys will be so lucky. That's how great those kids were. And I remember thinking, the bed is surrounded. You can hardly get in the room. And I've been a priest for 21 years. And I'm around that bed, and I'm not sure what to do or what to say. The kids are doing a great job. And then Nico Garcia turns to me. Nico turns to me, and he says, Father, do you have a Bible? Not I'm a priest. <laughs> do you have a Bible? It's like, isn't that sort of like asking, hey, Father, are, are your car keys in your pocket? <laughs> and I have to look at Nico and say, Nico, I don't have a Bible with Mary. I have the book of prayers I'm going to use to anoint Greg. So Nico takes out his iPhone. And he looks up at his iPhone in the 23rd Psalm. And Nico reads it to all of us. And I'm standing there thinking, I'm a priest. I should have thought of that. <laughs> so Nico, you're my mentor. And Nico, you taught me a lesson. But I do have. Today I do have a Bible. I have my Bible. And in the Bible, of course, is the 23rd Psalm that Nico read. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He guides me, I fear no evil. Goodness and love follow me all the days of my life. But you know, if you took your Bible and looked up the 23rd Psalm, you just turn back one page to Psalm 22. This is what it says. My God, my God, why have you forsaken them? Why are you so far from saving me? I cry out day by day that you do not answer. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. Psalm 23 that Nico read, that is a faith that all of us should have. That is a childlike faith. Psalm 22 <laughs> models fidelity, a deeper, more mysterious kind of faith. And life with God always includes both. There are some times when we experience, when we experience, I bet you all have, this unusual closeness with God when every prayer seems to be answered and God seems so intimate and caring. And then all of a sudden, there's this fog that moves in, this fog time, when God stays silent, when nothing works according to formula, and all the Bible's promises seem glaringly false. Fidelity involves learning to trust that. Out beyond that perimeter of fog, God still reigns. God has not abandoned you, no matter how it may appear. But let's get down and not dodge the questions that those kids were asking, that maybe you all are asked, that we asked. Like, why did God let this happen? Greg was just skateboarding. You might say, you know, I skateboard. My friends skateboard. It's safe. Why would this happen? And when Greg lay in that bed, I've been asked, was his soul and his spirit still with him? Or is heaven here on this earth? And finally, the big one, Father, why wasn't there a miracle? So let's begin with this. And this was in U.S. Catholic. In fact, it's, the author is talking about something I completely agree with. And it is this. Ladies and gentlemen, never, never, never can we say that somehow Greg's accident was within the cosmic plan of God. God is dead sent against. He is dead set against all unnatural deaths. And Jesus Christ spent an inordinate amount of time delivering people on this earth from paralysis and insanity and leprosy and mutants. The one thing I believe that we should never say when someone dies is, is this. Turn to them and say, somehow this is the will of God. And it won't be until you get to heaven that you'll discover what God had in mind what his major purpose was. I do not believe that we can do that 
because I don't believe that we ever know enough to say that. And while it is true that God's thoughts and ways are way above our thoughts and ways, ultimately I think when that thinking is applied to suffering, it almost becomes a denial of the Incarnation. Because I think the whole point of Jesus coming to this earth was that God, God's ways are somewhat our ways. And God's thoughts are somewhat our thoughts. And if we're just told when there's a tragedy, well, it's all a mystery, and we'll only find out in heaven, I don't know, I don't think that's enough. Greg's death and his suffering and our suffering is deeply mysterious at one level. But if the best we can say to one another when the going gets tough is, it's all a mystery, then I think that we're in trouble. But I think we can say this. Our consolation lies in knowing that it is not the will of God that Greg should die. And that when Greg left that skateboard, God's heart was the first to break. So where was the miracle? Where was the miracle? Where was God? Why did it happen? First of all, I know from personal experience, I'm not going to go into it, but trust me, I know you're going to look at me and say, what in the world? Uh, about, I don't know, 1981, 1979, God walked across, Jesus walked across the street with me, the intersection of Union and Lake. He really did. So I know that miracles happen. But I also believe that every time there is an act of love and of goodness, like Xavier High School taking over Desert Regional Hospital, that God is intervening in the world, but through the most ordinary of ways. And for understandable reasons, hey, I want miracles, I want the supernatural, I want the extraordinary. And Jesus Christ himself says countless times in the Bible, you know, I've come for the poor. I come for those that need me, for the sick, for the naked, for the homeless. Our God does intervene, but in and through the most extraordinary acts of love. And I believe that love beats hate every single day in this world. And the acts of love shown to Greg and to his family this past week happen every day in every city, every town throughout the world. And I believe that's what makes this world worth living in. So where was God? Where was God when Greg was in that bed? Well, I remember that nurse when we had 20 people in this little room, and this wonderful nurse trying to dodge in between us and do her job. God was in all the health professionals who did their very best for Greg. God was incarnated in everyone and everything that worked towards Greg's recovery. God was in the extraordinary response that was evoked from family and friends. And God was in the hearts of Greg's parents and brother, and in the kids who took over room 3131. God was there at every moment of this drama, every moment of your sorrow. And when Greg died, and this is important that you know this, when Greg died, God was there. For when Greg died, he fell into the arms of God. So why did it happen? Well, Mr. Allen says, there's no spinning this, it just stinks. You know what? That's almost the best that I can do too. My answer is not really very satisfying. Why did it happen? But I was asked by one of you, really more than one of you, if heaven was on this earth. And the answer is no. God created this world, but he made it less than perfect. If our earth was perfect, it would be heaven, because only the perfect rest in heaven. And God, God does not, when he created this earth, give us a stable of bad things. God is not like it has been written. God is not like a Harry Potter film, a God who is genuinely quite good, but every so often goes off to the apartment of dark artists. But God did this. God did this. God created us as fallible. We are weak human beings, and we will be on this earth until either by natural attrition or accident, we die. Because that's just the way it is. That's the way God wanted it. We are a night human being. But it's just that I want a perfect ending. I want a perfect ending. But Greg's death teaches us the hard way 
that some poems do not rhyme, and some stories do not have a clear beginning or a clear end. Life is not about knowing. Life is about having to change. Life is about taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what is going to happen next. So what about Greg? Where were his soul and his spirit when he was in that hospital room? I believe, I believe that they were still with Greg. When I looked at Greg, when I looked at that energetic body sinking into its last sleep, I thought that his soul, that glowing, gorgeous, fervent soul of Greg, surely was flaming in eager joy upon the coming light of heaven. Where is he now? He's with our God. The same God who was with him in that hospital room. For Greg, death is not. Death is not the closing of the door. Death is the opening of one. It is really not death at all. For Greg, his life has changed. It is not ended. And has changed infinitely for the better. And anything that Greg ever heard about heaven here on this earth absolutely pales in comparison to what he's now experiencing. So Greg, Greg beat all of us to the grave. He beat all of us to the grave. But the finish line was not some street in Palm Springs. If this past Sunday a lamp went out, it was because for Greg the dawn had come. And it is a great truth and it is not make-believe, this truth. It is not a myth, it is not superstition that Greg has never been as alive as he is right now. Please, let's stand.
Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours will be acceptable to God. As we humbly present you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your servant Greg, we beseech your mercy that he who did not doubt your son to be a loving Savior may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation. Always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In Him the hope of blessed resurrection is dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, Life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without him we acclaim. <laughs>
are made holy, O Lord, the fount of all holy. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them, like the dewfall, so that they may become before us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, Jesus took bread, he broke it, he gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, Jesus took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery. Remember your servant Greg, whom you have called today from this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with your son in a death like his 